Hello, I'm Peter Walter. I work at the University of California at San Francisco, and we are basically cellbiologists trying to figure out how cells work, um, specializing on organelle biogenesis and how proteins get to the right place and how they function. And ultimately, we would like to understand how proteins work as molecular machines to make cells as, as wonderful and as complicated as they are. So what I want to tell you today is a, a brief story of discovery. I think one of the most wonderful discoveries that was made in my lab in, in my career. And it involves uh, the reaction by which uh, cells decide how much of a particular organelle they have to have. And the organelle that I'm going to tell you about is the endoplasmic reticulum, which is the, the first way station which proteins enter um, as they uh, uh, move through the secretory pathway to the surface of the cell and are being secreted or inserted in the plasma membrane. Um, the endoplasmic reticulum then is, this, is, is, is the place where proteins have to they enter the ER, they have to fold, they have to become assembled from multiple subunits, they become modified, they be, uh, carbohydrate is added, disulfide bonds are formed, and all of these reactions are important to produce properly functioning proteins. And cells that are specialized, that make a lot of proteins and secrete them, have to have a lot of endoplasmic reticulum in order to, to carry out these processes with fidelity and, and with appropriate, uh, pro appropriately abundant machinery. Um, the proteins enter the endoplasmic reticulum unfolded state as they come out of the ribosome. And then as they are in this organelle, they basically have to mature. And if they cannot fold properly, then a cell basically uh, uh, Put, uh, puts, puts proteins in its plasma membrane or, or secretes them. And, and because all the machinery that, that is required for a cell to know where it is in the body, what it has to do, how it has to behave in the context of a multicellular organism, all this information is being transmitted by proteins that are being secreted or by the machineries that sit in the plasma membrane. So it's, it's very, very important that these machineries work properly, are properly assembled, um, because otherwise you may create a rogue cell um, that doesn't know when to divide, when to differentiate, um, when to die, when to migrate to another place, and so on and so forth. So, so for the organism, this is a very important uh, process. And this is sort of uh, amplified in this slide, um, where you look at the, the differentiation of a cell, uh, a precursor cell here, that turns into a professional secretory cell. And in this case, it's a plasma cell. And the plasma cells are the cells that make antibodies that are being secreted into the bloodstream. So this cell makes its own weight every day in antibody molecules. And you see that this differentiation event goes hand in hand with this vast proliferation of endoplasmic reticulum that basically fills the cytosol wall to wall. So how does that cell know how much endoplasmic reticulum it needs? So there must be signaling pathways in the cell that figure out how much of an organelle we have and how much is, is, uh, uh, should be there um, according to the need of the secretory uh, uh, load that the cell has. And this signaling pathway that transmits that information, uh, which we've been studying for the last uh, 15 years or so, is called the unfolded protein response. And it's called the unfolded protein response because it initiates with an accumulation of unfolded or misfolded proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum. And these proteins, the, uh, uh, they're unfolded because there isn't enough capacity to fold them properly from the machinery. These proteins then create a signal that's being transmitted across the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum and that ends up eventually in the nuclear compartment where it turns up a vast gene expression program that makes uh, uh, basically more endoplasmic reticulum protein folding capacity, secretory capacity, capacity to great proteins that cannot be folded properly, and so on and so forth. So it brings cells back into homeostatic, uh, uh, homeostatic state um, that, that, that uh, allows the load of secretory proteins to be balanced with the machinery available to carry out that task. Um, to figure out how this pathway works, um, two very adventurous graduate students in my lab, um, Jeff Cox and Carolyn Shamu, um, started a project um, in which we tried to identify these components genetically in the yeast system. And basically what they did is they built a reporter system based on an observation made by Katsutoshi Mori and Mary Jane Gessing in Joe Sambrook's lab that there is a small element in the promoters 
of the target genes of the response that can be transplanted, can be put in front of a reported gene, and then we can isolate mutants in the cell where when we, when we, when we induce unfolded proteins in the ER, that no longer induce uh, uh, the unfolded protein response by this uh, induction of this reported gene. We can then take these mutants, we can uh, clone the genes that have been mutated by complementation um, and figure out what they do in the pathway. And the nice thing is that the first gene which we isolated this way turns out to be IA1 and it encodes a transmembrane kinase. So by virtue of it being a transmembrane kinase, it already told us that this, uh, uh, that this may be the signal transduction device sitting in the R membrane, figuring out in one end what's going on there and transmitting that information across the bilayer. Very nicely, the second gene we isolated turns out to be HAC1, and HAC1 encodes a transcription factor that binds to all these promoter elements. So we then have a transmembrane kinase, we have a transcription factor, and of course the way we are thinking about that is very much in analogy to other transmembrane kinases like growth factor receptors in the plasma membrane of mammalian cells, that this thing is activated and functions by a process of oligomerization in the plane of the membrane, where in the, uh, as unfolded proteins accumulate, these kinase molecules come together. They start uh, uh, bringing the kinases together on the other side of the, of the membrane, where they are now juxtaposed so they can trans out of phosphorylate each other. And that somehow leads to a phosphorylation cascade downstream that activates the transcription factor. But it turns out that it, nothing could be further from the truth. This pathway is wired in a completely different way in a completely unexpected way. And that was discovered pretty much by a series of control experiments that Jeff carried out. And here's the, the first one where we very simply, very uh, naively, just started looking for the transcription factor in cells that are either induced for the response or that are not. And as you can see here, the transcription factor is only present in cells when the response is induced. Um, so that tells us two things right then and there, right? It means either degraded when it's not needed or it's only synthesized when, it's, when, when the response is induced. And to distinguish between these two possibilities, what Jeff did is he just did a, a, a simple northern blood analysis by which he asked, does the messenger RNA encoding this transcription factor change in its abundance um, when we induce unfolded proteins? As you see here, the messenger RNA doesn't really change much in abundance, but what you see, what, what Jeff discovered here, is that we now have a band of a different size um, that was completely unexpected. So the simple northern blot then led to the discovery that there is something happening to the messenger RNA, and to make a long story short, it turns out that this messenger RNA becomes spliced, and intron is being removed when the unfolded protein response is induced. So the idea then is that the, the messenger RNA encoding the transcription factor is initially encoded with this intron, and as the, the unfolded proteins accumulate, this intron is being removed, producing the spliced messenger RNA, which is then being translated to produce the transcription up factor that turns up the response. Now this is highly unusual. Normally when cells decide to change their transcription to their splicing program, do some alternative splicing, they make reasonably irreversible developmental decisions um, so that they, they last a, a long time. They enter a different cell fate um, with these decisions. But this is bona fide signaling. What's happening here is, is depend, strictly dependent on the conditions inside the endoplasmic reticulum. The signaling is on and off depending on whether you have unfolded proteins or not. What's even more surprising is that the splicing reaction followed none of the rules of normal messenger RNA splicing. It's completely independent of the spliceosome. Um, it's happening in the cytosol, and it's carried out by two enzymes and two enzymes only. The first one turns out to be IA1. Our transmembrane kinase, when activated, becomes a bifunctional protein that is not only a kinase, but also a site-specific endoribonuclease that cleaves the messenger RNA encoding the transcription factor precisely at both splice junctions. And to the best of our knowledge, is the only messenger RNA in the cell that it touches. And then along comes an enzyme called TNA ligase, which was previously only known for its role in tRNA splicing. 
and we had isolated a mutation in that, and another graduate student, Kamala Sedrowski, and we couldn't make any sense out of that until Jeff had discovered that there's this RNA uh, uh, processing step in this signaling pathway. So the unfolded protein response then transmits the signal by this, this unconventional, completely unprecedented, non -con uh, uh, splicing pathway, um, and there is no phosphorylation cascade anywhere inside here. Um, let me just show you that this is true. We can make this messenger RNA in vitro. We can incubate it with recombinantly produced IRE1. And you see that the messenger RNA gets cleaved, producing the intron 5 prime exon, 3 prime exon. And then as we add also recombinantly produced purified uh, tRNA ligase to this reaction, the, the exons go away um, and get ligated to form the product, and the intron stays put. So we can reconstitute this whole uh, uh, a pathway from two purified components with, with, with quite nice efficiency. To make a long story short, this discovery then led to many other labs and, and it turned out that pretty much everything, the salient features that we've learned from the, the simple yeast uh, uh, system hold true for mammalian and, and, and metazoan uh, uh, cells. Um, so this uh, IAE1 exists in metazoan cells. It is involved in the splicing of a messenger RNA encoding a transcription factor, XPP1, XPP1 here. Um, things are more complicated. Higher evolved eukaryotic cells have added more bells and whistles to the pathway. So we have uh, three parallel pathways here that transmits the information from the ER lumen to the cytosol, each leading to the activation of a transcription factor. We have IRE1 working by this non-conventional mRNA splicing. We have another transmembrane kinase here, PERC, that makes another transcription factor by a mechanism of translational control. And finally, we have this exciting protein here that sits in the uh, membrane ATF6 um, and then gets released, a fragment of it gets released to become an active transcription factor that moves into the nucleus and turns up the target genes only in, when unfolded proteins uh, uh, are accumulating in the endoplasmic reticulum. And the idea of the whole thing is the same as I told you before, is to establish, uh, re-establish homeostasis so protein folding in the endoplasmic reticulum can occur with fidelity. So we have these three pathways here and they establish homeostasis. But I also tell, told you that there is a danger that if cells are, um, cannot achieve homeostasis, that, that they may make mistakes in protein folding and therefore turn into rogue cells that endanger an organism. So there's a safety valve built in that if this balance cannot be achieved again, um, that cells, rather than uh, uh, putting these, these uh, misfolded proteins uh, um, and misfolded signaling machines on, on the cell surface, go down the pathway of apoptosis. Um, so rather than becoming rogue cells and endanger the, the, the organism, they remove themselves by committing suicide. And it's this, this, this uh, point that the, this, the unfolded protein response makes life death decisions for the cell that puts this pathway in the midst of many different human diseases. Um, some cancer cells are kept uh, alive be, be because uh, the, res the response uh, uh, gives them a, a growth advantage um, di in diabetes. The beta cells in the pancreas uh, um, may die through this apoptotic road here. Um, by being overcommitted to produce ever-increasing ever amounts of, of, of insulin, and we have neurodegenerative diseases where protein misfolding um, causes apoptosis by turning up this, this response. Um, so basically then our, our very um, uh, pioneering, the, the pioneering work of, of these very adventurous graduate students um, has led us to understand the mechanism that we now, we and many other labs, um, try to, uh, 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 to, to utilize in, in therapeutic approaches to see if we can uh, have some ability of uh, bettering uh, uh, mankind via, via interfering and modulating these pathways and therefore affecting the outcome of human disease. And I